Hello and welcome to a webinar brought to you by AIA Contract Documents. In this webinar, we're going to be talking about two brand new documents that are being published by the AIA Contract Documents program in late September 2021, uh, so later on this month. Uh, those agreements are the C403 Client and Consultant Agreement for Design Assist Services uh, and the C404 Contractor and Consultant Agreement for Delegated Design Services. Um, I should say that I believe these are really interesting documents for our program because for as common as delegated design and design assist have become on projects, this is the first time that AIA contract documents has offered agreements that are specifically tailored for these collaborative processes. Uh, my name is Mike Coger. I'm an attorney who's been working with the AIA contract documents program for about eight years now. Uh, joining me on this video are Roger Atanasio and Josh Flowers, both of whom uh, worked on developing these documents over the last year or so. Uh, Roger is an architect and principal at the firm LS3P. Uh, he's based out of Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, and he was the chair of the task group that created these two documents. Uh, Josh is both an architect and an attorney, and he works for the architecture firm Gresham Smith. Josh is based out of Nashville, Tennessee, uh, and is part of Gresham Smith's risk management team. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items before we start really getting into talking about these two documents. Uh, we're going to be talking generally about legal issues throughout this webinar um, in this video. Uh, however, we can't give you legal advice. You know, we're going to be generally talking about um, design assist, delegated design. Uh, but when it, if you have a specific question about how to complete our forms, how to negotiate them, how to tackle a particular issue on your projects, uh, there's really no substitute for contacting a local attorney who can help you navigate those issues. Uh, also, we have 30 minutes carved out for this webinar. Uh, but we'll almost certainly go a little bit over that. So we're going to, you know, hopefully get at least a, a pretty good, you know, overview of, of these two documents. Uh, but we'll probably realistically go about 45 minutes or so with this one. So if you have to drop off, uh, don't worry. This will be posted on our website, on our, on our YouTube channel as well, uh, fairly shortly. So in this webinar, we're going to be talking about these two documents uh, and learn from the folks who created them. Um, you know, what delegated design and design assist services are, how to use the new documents that the AIA is offering now, uh, and some of the nuanced issues that you might run into in contracting for these kinds of services. Um, Roger and, and Josh, before I start bombarding you with some questions about these new documents, uh, I just have one other thing to mention, uh, and that is a few years ago, the AIA Contract Documents Program uh, started working with the American Institute of Seal Construction to better understand delegated design and design assist. Uh, and how those terms were commonly used in the industry. We're not going to talk about that collaborative effort all that much during this uh, during this video. Uh, however, I, I want to at least touch on the point that we did create a white paper um, collaboratively with with AISC, and that web white paper can be found on AIA's um, the AIA Contract Documents website. Um, the easiest way to find it is to just go Google search Design Collaboration AIA. It's the first link you'll find. Um, a couple of takeaways from that paper that are relevant to this discussion is, you know, we found after, you know, uh, talking to a lot of folks in the industry and, and reviewing a whole lot of materials that were out there, that there really is a general consensus in the industry around the terms and concepts of delegated design and design assist, but there's plenty of misinformation out there. Uh, so, you know, for every three or four articles you read, you know, one of them is going to say something that's inconsistent with the others. So we wrote that white paper um, and got input from folks like I know Roger gave some input on that document as well, um, really with the idea of trying to sum up the general consensus of these terms and dispel some of that misinformation that was out there. Uh, so at this point, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Sydney, who's assisting us with this uh, video, to flash up a graphic that is really the big takeaway of that paper to kind of set the stage for what we're going to be talking about here. The diagram parse out some um, comparisons between phrases like informal involvement, where an architect might informally talk with a contractor with no contractual underpinnings to you know, get some advice or get some kind of an assistance with a design uh, issue uh, to design assist, which is another step further in the design collaboration process. Uh, that typically happens uh, early on during the um, design phases, schematic design um, and and delegate and, and the uh, uh, the other phases, you know, that are kind of earlier on in the design process. Then delegated design being a further step um, where the the architecture firm or the design firm actually hands off a particular piece of the design project to a secondary designer through a con contractor intermediary. 
and then design build being something that's completely separate where um, one entity is taking on the entire uh, design and construction um, uh, um, of, a, of a project, not just a piece of it. So with that backdrop, um, uh, I'm going to first turn to you, Roger. I'm going to kind of reorient us back to those C403 and C404 documents. Uh, can you give us, Roger, um, a big picture perspective of what, what those two documents are all about, what we're trying to accomplish with publishing them? Sure. Thanks, Mike. C403, or Design Assist, and C404, Delegated Designer, are concepts or more accurately processes that have been used in practice for years. Design Assist was created to allow design professionals responsible for the design process, architects, engineers, architects and their engineering consultants, to obtain expertise from industry practitioners in developing those designs. The design professional determines how the design assist services are to be incorporated into their design and remains professionally responsible for the design um, delegated or design services. Delegated design service is a process allowing those with a specific expertise in a particular building component or system to design that component or system to comply with performance criteria, performance and design criteria established by the design professionals. Examples of delegated design services include, but are not limited to, curtain walls, custom shaped exterior metal panels, fire protection systems, exterior stud framing, uh, or segmental retaining walls. Design assist services usually occur during the early design phases before the design is complete, whereas delegated design services usually occur during the early phases of construction. Excellent. And and just, and Roger, just to follow up on that, I, you know, you, you do architectural projects all the time. How often are you running into these concepts on your projects? I mean, is it a fairly, uh, you know, often occurrence or is this just a, occasionally you're seeing these things on your projects? Um, frequently for, de for design assist, but almost on all projects for delegated design services. Right. Okay. Um, and well, I'll definitely ask you some more questions about design assist when we get into talking specifically about C403. But Josh, I want to turn it over to you for a second. And um, and I, what is now showing on the screen is that is that the big diagram I was talking about as far as it's a massive oversimplification of these terms, but it at least is kind of sets the stage a little bit for some of the key concepts. Um, Josh, you worked on these documents uh, with Roger for the last year or so. Can you give us kind of a the why part of the of the equation. Why did ACD, you know, AI contract documents create this document, these documents, and why should someone think about using them, or or how exactly would they go about using them? Right, because this process started, Mike, with what you were talking about earlier. Is how is this terminology being used in the industry, and how is it applying to specific projects? So that was really the first goal: is establishing that common terminology in a way that's used consistently, because there is that consensus out there in the industry. But if you're on working on a particular project, you may hear the term design assist or delegated design tossed around, and it wouldn't really have a specific meaning because it's not documented anywhere. It's just being used informally on the project. So if information was coming into the project and someone said it was through a design assist process, that may mean many different things. So these documents were intended to first establish that common terminology for the way the information is used. And then beyond that, once we got into the process of really looking at what is an agreement for design assist or delegated design, it was looking at if you are a company who's providing those services, how is your information being used on the project and how does that need to be tied in to all of the other agreements and documents that define how the process takes place? So for instance, if there is a governing document like a prime agreement, are there provisions of that that should apply to these companies that are providing those services? Um, there were things like intellectual property rights that needed to be addressed. Um, and then also some of the things that you kind of take for granted on a project, like if there's a BIM document that just says how the parties work together, typically that is referenced as an exhibit in the different 
agreements for the parties. But if you don't have an agreement, there's really no way to make sure that those exhibits are binding. So having a written agreement was very important as we started working through the details of that. And then beyond those two things, if you're providing services at all, you want to have a definition of what you're providing, how you get paid, just the basics of contracts. And through the research, we saw that a lot of times that was uh, done uh, very much in a non-standard way. And so trying to make sure that all of the parties participating on the project have written documentation of their scope and their fee and, and the way they work together on the project. Absolutely, I couldn't have said better. It's really about kind of getting, bringing some consistency, you know, to this area. Um, and just from a very practical perspective from an AIA contract documents program, these were documents that folks would regularly call in and ask us for. So eventually we decided, hey, we should maybe make them. Um, and these are concepts, you know, particularly delegated design, uh, which we'll talk about, you know, the kind of nuanced contractual underpinnings of it here in a moment. But um, these concepts are already embedded into our existing documents. If you look at A201, there is a provision that you can very clearly point to um, in Article 3 that is a delegated design provision. And it and it sets out a process for uh, the, the contractor to hire a design professional to do delegated design work. A lot of folks asked us, hey, can you can you give us a contractor uh, consultant agreement? And we didn't have one up until up until just now. Um, so, Josh, I'll, I'll ask you kind of the same question I asked Roger. Um, you know, how often are you doing design assist and how often are you doing delegated design? Is it is your experience track with what Roger said? I think I would say now it's almost every project has some aspect of that. And it crosses over any project delivery method, um, any client type or market type, because these methods are now so standard in the industry that it seems like any type of project will have some aspect of that that occurs. And that would not have been the case maybe 10 years ago where this was considered a little bit more of a new concept and there was some uncertainty about what it meant. Now it's so pervasive that uh, it reinforces the need for these documents to be in place uh, because it is now uh, used so frequently. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so now that we've kind of talked about like the broad picture of what, what these documents are all about, um, Roger, I want to turn now to the C403 and talk you know, specifically about design assist. Um, I always need examples when I'm thinking of these kinds of things. Can you give me kind of like a cup, an example or two about a design assist workflow and how, how that works and what, you know, what kind of a uh, element of the project that you might be thinking about using design assist on or that might, you might, you might occur on a project? Sure. Um, I got two or three, a, a CM during a pre-construction phase of an owner construction manager as constructor, a A133 agreement, or a contractor uh, prior to establishing a GMP on an A102 agreement, or a design builder under a A141 owner design builder agreement could utilize this design assist agreement with a trade partner uh, to assist with a constructability issue, such as how to secure a custom veneer to a backup wall or structure, or the development of a specific detail, such as how to uh, detail a photovoltaic panel system on the roof so you don't negatively affect the roof warranty or the drainage of a roof system. There's just a couple of ways that this could be used. Okay. Um, and, and and just to drill down on the, the the custom like the custom veneer, like what kind of information as an architect um, are you looking for from a trade partner who might be providing some kind of assistance on that? Like, can you can you tell us like what well, what information do you want from them? So we may have a specific form that we're looking for, and a manufacturer of that panel can help us uh, develop that form. And then how does that form connect to a structure that our structural engineer is supposed to do it? So they can take that form and say, well, we can do it this way or we can do it that way. And if you use this, it affects your project in this manner. If you do it that way, it affects your project in that manner. They are they have the expertise in how their product might be able to be attached to our structure. And so we look to them to help us do that so we can determine what else it would affect as we go through trying to, to develop our design. Right. Cause you know, as a, as someone who is installing, I guess, 
those particular things, uh, you know, those veneers on a day-to-day -day basis, they're very familiar with kind of a, the attachment, you know, and how that works and what's not worked in the past, right? And you as an architect, well, maybe you've dealt with it once or twice and before, but you could use their input on on their kind of learned experience. Is that is that right? Absolutely. It, it, it may lead to different di different manners and how we attach our structure, different forms that we use, different forms that we don't use. So yeah, uh, we, we try to use their expertise in helping us understand what we can do to develop the design that we're looking for. And so I assume that any input that they might give you, that could eventually end up, you know, finding its way into your designs, your 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 uh, the documents that you're putting together uh, to to actually, you know, form the contract of the construction contract. Is that is that right? That's uh, quite possible. It's quite possible. That's correct. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> let's see. So uh, one thing that I should make clear the C the C403 document it, it is uh, termed as a client consultant agreement. Um, that there's no real place for an architect in that agreement. However, the kind of input that the consultant would be um, providing to the project would find its way back to the architect in some way, right? There's going to be a, is that um, is that a pretty fair statement of how that should work with the C403? Absolutely. Uh, it will find its way back to the architect's office and in the uh, to the architect's documents. Uh, design assist could occur at, at multiple levels of a project. So the agreement forms needed to were needed to be flexible enough to be used in connection with multiple parties, while still providing consistent terms related to the project. The task group created the, uh, the document with the thought in mind, and we initially started out using it for uh, the, the CM family during the pre-construction phase of, of uh, A133 or 134. We then decided to create a document that could be used on multiple by multiple project participants, whether it be the owner, whether it be a client or a contractor, whether it be a, uh, an architect or an architect's consultant for a variety of delivery systems, CMS construction, design build or design bid build. We, we use the term agnostic because we wanted it to be used by anybody uh, to reflect the fact that the agreement does not dictate any one particular party or who should be providing design assist services to the project we wanted to be make we wanted it to be used by as many different parties as possible so we didn't want to say it was by a trade partner and an architect only or by a, a subcontractor with a cm or a subcontractor and a contractor anybody working on the project can utilize this agreement for design assist services Gotcha. I assume though it's fair to say that most of the time when you're, you know, in, in projects that are you're working on today, when you see when if you were to ever see a C403 used, it probably most of the time would be between the construction manager and a trade partner or between a contractor and a trade partner. Is that is that right? Uh probably. That's correct. That's that, that's when it's going to be most most widely used. That's that's accurate. Okay. Um and Josh, does that kind of track with your experience as well? I mean, most of the time when you're doing seeing design assist uh is is it usually that contractor to uh, or cm to a sub trade relationship as of today i would say that is the case but one of the things that we looked at when we were creating these documents is where is the industry going for the future and where do we see the shifts taking place so this is intended to bridge the gap as project delivery changes if that's not the standard method in the future these would still be applicable uh, to different projects gotcha excellent um <clears throat> roger one thing that you, if you look through the c403 you'll you'll see and this is not necessarily um uh, specific to just the c403 a number of our other documents have this concept and it's referring back to the prime contract um, can you talk about the role of the prime contract when you're using a C403 document? Yes, I can. Um, uh, the terms of the prime agreement or the prime contract are not incorporated in this design of sixth agreement, except for provisions of the prime that apply specifically to the design assist services. The terms of the prime agreement that are to be incorporated, there is a fill point. So you specifically have to address what's going to be included in the design assist agreement from the prime agreement. 
The thought behind this concept was that the design professional and not the design assist consultant was going to be professionally responsible for the incorporation of the design assist services into the agreement. So while the design assist consultant may give it to the architect or the design professional, the design professional decides or determines how those design assist services are ultimately to be incorporated into the documents. You spoke earlier about how does the the structure for those custom wall panels get incorporated into the uh, instruments of service of the architect? Well, the design professional is responsible under this design assist agreement for incorporating those design assist services into their design. Interesting. So have you ever had any conflict where, you know, you've got a trade contractor who's suggested, um, you know, a, a particular solution and you as the architect are like, I don't think that's going to work. I'm going to go a different direction. Does that ever come up at all in your projects? It can. I mean, you get design assist services because you're trying to draw upon the expertise of somebody who may have a, a more specific expertise than I do as an architect. And then I have to look at what they've provided and decide how I'm going to use it. So, yes, sometimes you use their ideas and sometimes you don't. You may get two or three design assist um, relationships going to decide what's the best way for what I'm trying to accomplish on this particular design. Gotcha. Josh, I know you're the you're, you're our risk management guy. Um, you uh, this is literally what you do on a day to day basis is think about risk. Uh, and and uh, do, when you're have you seen this kind of issue in uh, doing design assist work on your projects at your firm uh, where there's a bit of a, a back and forth, maybe even a little bit of conflict on how to resolve something? Um, and I, yeah, I would say the complication usually comes in when cost is involved is the information increasing the cost or is it intended to help bring the cost back down and how does that correspond with the quality of the design and so that's when you get into a lot of those questions of trying to balance those two considerations gotcha so do, like on the on the whole is it you know when you see design assist and and it kind of creeping into your projects do you see that as increasing risks for architects uh, or for your for your firm, or do you see that as something that might actually decrease risk? Typically, it should be decreasing the risk because you're bringing in some specialized expertise to answer a specific question, and usually that's a good thing for the project to get more expertise involved. Absolutely. Um, so, since we've been talking about you know the kind of services that a uh, a trade partner might provide or some anybody who's doing design assist would provide they're giving input on the design in some way um, should they have professional liability insurance and i guess i'll just open that up to both of you but Rod, I mean, roger do you want to take a lead at that one uh, yeah i think we decided uh, as a group that because this design assist consultant is not going to be sealing uh, or providing uh, uh, professional design, be responsible for the for the professional design services. Well, we said unless required in the uh, jurisdiction where the project is is being performed or being done, uh, the design assist consultant did not have to have professional liability insurance because the uh, design professional utilizing those services was going to be ultimately responsible for that design. The design liability remained with the design professional. Therefore. Design Assist Consultant did not have to have professional liability insurance. We don't require it. There is a place in the document to add it if you, as a user of the of the document, decide it's necessary. But right now, the document does not require the Design Assist Consultant to have professional liability insurance. Gotcha. And that's one big uh, difference that we'll see when we turn our attention to delegated design, um, where you're almost certainly always going to have professional liability uh, insurance for the secondary designer. Um, we, we're, we're, we're getting a little bit long in this video, so I'm going to skip ahead just a little bit. Um, but before I do, you know, uh, one of my things, I, I always, when I read about design assist, I always read about the good things. Uh, but I, occasionally I'll hear there are some potential downsides to design assist that folks should at least be aware of. It doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with design assist. And generally speaking, it's a very good thing and very good practice when done right. Um, Josh, you or Roger, have either of you have any kind of thoughts on potential things that architects or contractors or owners should be looking out for uh, with regard to design assist and pitfalls to avoid? One that I would mention is 
design assist is bringing an additional opinion into the process. And so that opinion could reinforce the ones you've already heard, or it could be in conflict. And so depending on the information that you're hearing, there may need to be a resolution as to how that gets integrated. And is it in conflict with the other established uh, documents that you already have in place? Excellent. Roger, any, any thoughts about potential pitfalls for design assist? Uh, one could be intellectual property. I mean, um, uh, ultimately, the d design assist services usually occurs early in the process. So the uh, design assist consultant is going to offer their 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 instruments of service, their their expertise on a particular item. Uh, that that information is then taken by the architect and uh, incorporated in their projects. And so, who owns that intellectual property? at the end of the day. So that's something else that's going to have to be worked out during the agreement or when you execute this agreement. Absolutely. And I'll just add before we move on to the, the C404 delegated design document, the one thing I've heard from architects over time is that if you have, if you're bringing on uh, contractors or someone with the builder's expertise, trade partner, um, to do uh, design assist kind of later in the design, it can just feel like value engineering and second guessing. So. Um, you know, we encourage folks, I mean, I'm sure that y'all would agree with this, that we encourage folks to, if you're going to do design assist, bring in, you know, your, bring in whoever's given that, ass that assisting role, bring them in early so that you can get the best benefit uh, out of their insights and their knowledge. Um, anything else before we ta start talking about C404, guys? Not for me. Excellent. So the next document, um, is C404, uh, and that's our delegated design document. It is style, if you read the title, as a contractor consultant agreement. Um, Josh, can you just give us a, a kind of a big picture view of how, of how C404 might be used? So for delegated design, you're looking at some predetermined component of the design where the design professional of record is establishing performance and design criteria, but there's a separate design professional who's retained to actually create the design for that component. So there's a give and take between the design professional who's establishing the criteria and the design professional who will actually be signing and sealing the documents for that particular component. So it's a much more, uh, stringent process than just the design assist process because it's documented in the specifications it's referred to in the project agreements and it will now have this separate agreement to tie in the party who's providing the design assist services so it is a different approach uh, it has its own um, aspects to it that are a little bit unique in the way that it's tied into the project um, and it is more stringent in the way it's uh, applied in project settings. Excellent. And and that process that you described of, of specifications directing a contractor to hire a, a design professional uh, to give some um, to, to put some literal contract terms to that. If you look at the A A two hundred one section three point twelve point ten point one, yeah, we we buried it in there. Uh, that is the language. That's that process that Josh was just describing. So if you, you know, want to break out your A two hundred one and find where that language is, um, and then then you certainly can do that down there in uh, in, in Article three. Um, and that's language that's been in our documents for a while. Um, that that process, that recognizing that that process can and occasionally will occur, um, it's in, I think at least been in our document in the A201 since the 90s, uh, since the 97 version. We just now got around to writing the uh, the actual agreement to to fulfill that obligation. So um, uh, definitely a good thing. Um, can uh, Roger, you said that you do you see delegated design on almost every project you work on. Uh, can you give us some of the more common, you know, uh, ways you see it on a project being used? Sure. Um, curtain wall design and how how a, a curtain wall is going to resist the wind loading that's going to be uh, uh, applied to it, and and how does that curtain wall fit into the architecture? How is that curtain wall going to be secured to the the backup wall or the structure? Is a is a common way it's used. Um, 
structural steel, exterior structural steel, um, excuse me, exterior steel stud framing is another way that it's used. Fire protection is, 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 is yet one that's used on almost every project. The sprinkler system is designed by the uh, sprinkler subcontractor or an engineer for the sprinkler subcontractor that then has to go to the fire marshal, whether it's at the local level or the state level. Um, segmental retaining walls is another one I, I, I see frequently used. Um, uh, those are four examples that uh, happen on just about every project. So it's uh, it's 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 common. Um, uh, it is it is done because there is a desire for someone with an expertise on a particular component of the building um, to be able to determine how that's going to be integrated and comply with the design aesthetic that's been created by the architect. Architect creates a design intent, and there's a, a, a an entity, another professional who has expertise to determine how that might fit into the building. We try mm -hmm. and get the, 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 use the knowledge of those most, uh, most knowledgeable about that co component or system um, uh, incorporated into the design. Excellent. So have, have either of you seen any kind of newer or interesting things that surprised you? Well, I didn't think this was going to be a delegated design component. I mean, we're all probably used to seeing like trusses and, you know, fire protection being done in a delegated design manner. Have either of you seen something that kind of surprised you as, oh, I didn't realize that, you know, maybe this is something that can be de delegated that I, I wasn't normally thinking about? I, I had a conversation with a young lady this morning. We were talking about the size of the cavity in a in a in a cavity wall, a uh, steel stud with a brick veneer, and because of the NFPA 285 fire propagation requirements and the type of insulation that has to be used in some some walls in lieu of combustible insulation, the cavity is starting to grow, and so when the cavity grows and it gets beyond a certain length, you have to have a structural tie. And this young lady asked me, well, who's responsible for designing that structural tie? Is that us or is that our structural engineer? And I said, well, um, probably our structural engineer. And she said, well, can't we do a delegated design for that? So that's one I never really thought about, delegating the design of a, a brick tie to a delegated designer. Now, whether that's going to happen or not, I'm not sure, but it's something we have to look into because the cavities in our walls are growing larger and larger because of... Uh, other requirements. Excellent. I had never thought about that either. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, uh, Josh. What about you in in your practice? Uh, are, are, I mean, I, are you are you seeing anything kind of unique being done in a delegated design manner? A lot of times, the design may determine if there's a direction that some aspect of the project lends itself to delegated design if there's something maybe a more sculptural element to the design where that specialized expertise will help work out some of the details of it that are a lot different from the project itself or if there's some experience that's needed with a particular material and that helps to resolve issues with the design more efficiently than just trying to coordinate it through the documents themselves those kinds of things could lend themselves to delegate a design uh, that would still need to be established through the specifications like we talked about earlier. Gotcha. Yeah, and, and that's a, a point of clarification. I mean, that, that we've already talked about a little bit, but in, in any of these instances, you're going to have the primary design professional architect, structural engineer is gonna be putting together specifications, um, you know, to, to, to very clearly pass off what the kind of expectation is for that designed component, right? Um, I mean, it's it's not like you're completely divorced from the process uh, as as the architect, right? That's correct. We're we're going to be establishing the performance and the design criteria. Somebody else is going to be uh, developing details to satisfy those performance and design criteria, and then the architect is going to be responsible for reviewing that. Uh, that that res that end result that that design to see that it complies with that criteria that was established and the aesthetics of the design that we uh, uh, we created the intent that we created. So once it's once it's designed by somebody else doesn't mean that we don't look at it ever again. We're we're still going to look at it just like we would uh, any other submittal that comes through from uh, from a contractor. 
Understood. So it's uh, you're you're delegating a piece, but you're still heavily involved. Um, and um, so I, I want to make a couple of clarifications about about the C404, and then I want to get back to that idea of of liability and design responsibility because that's something that I know I'm I'm interested in, and I want to hear your take on that a little bit more. Um, so Josh, real quick, I, we've already made this point, but I want to make it again. Delegated design is not design build, is it? It's not. So we talked about for delegated design, you have uh, a circumstance where there is a predetermined component of the design that is being dealt with through performance specifications. So there's a give and take of the design that's occurring through the performance spec and then the design that's being delegated uh, to the trade partner or to the delegated design professional who's providing those services. But with design build, the design and construction is occurring uh, within an agreement. So it's it's a little bit different um, in terms of the process and very different in terms of the documents that establish that relationship. Absolutely. Um, can you also know what there's also in the C404, the concept of a prime contract. And my understanding is it's a bit different. Um, a, a bit of a different analysis. Can you, Josh, can you talk us through that a little bit and tell us how that prime contract comes into play and what you might want to look out for if you're executing the C404? Yes, so with the C403 for design assist, we said that the prime agreement does not apply unless there's some specific aspect where the parties determine that it does apply. But with delegated design in the C404, the prime agreement does apply because it's intended to be consistent with the other agreements in place for the project. So um, the dispute resolution may reference the dispute resolution of the prime agreement and everything is set up so that the consultant signing this agreement is taking on the responsibilities of, of the prime professionals so that they are having the same relationship that they would um, when they're providing those services uh, as the as the prime would um, with regard to their specific aspect of the project. That's correct. So, what, what, what I think Josh is saying is that the, de the delegated designer is working for the contractor because the, the, the delegated design has been delegated to the contractor who has a contract with the owner, prime agreement with the, with the owner. And the contractor is expecting the delegated design professional to have towards the contractor the same requirements that the contractor has toward the owner. So that's why the prime contract is incorporated in the delegated design agreement, unlike that of the design assist. Gotcha. So um, now I want to I want to talk about. Uh, li design responsibility and liability potentially uh, issues. There's this interesting interplay that you guys have described about, you know, um, putting together performance specifications. The contractor takes on responsibility, hands it down to the design professional, secondary design professional. Um, can you, uh, uh, Josh, to put you on the spot, have you? Can you talk through a little bit about that interplay and and then you know what the primary design professional's responsibilities are and, and have you seen any issues with it? Yeah, because it's more, it becomes more important in this setting uh, to be very specific about the concept of right to rely. So the party who's providing the performance criteria um, should have a right to rely on the aspect of the design that's being delegated, uh, but the party who's taking on the delegation has a right to rely on the accuracy of the performance and design criteria that they're using as the basis of their design. So both of those have to be in place and need to be documented uh, in, in the agreements. Uh, and one important point about this, we talked a little bit earlier about this concept of delegated design and the fact that it has been in place in the standard AI documents for many years uh, in the general conditions. It has also been in place in the standard owner architect agreement. So there is a provision in the AIA B101 that talks about delegated design and the right to rely for 
the architect occurs in that provision. So this new document would complement that language and, and would build on that for uh, the design professional who's taking on the delegation responsibility. So it, it occurs in multiple documents and it's intended to be complementary, uh, but it has to be coordinated of, to make sure that it's consistent across the project. And have have either of you seen any issues or had any issues on your projects with delegated design uh, components that have, um, you know, some issues that have slipped between the cracks between the two design professionals? Yes. And so if there's something, if there's a problem that occurs with regard to an aspect of the design that falls into this category, you can imagine it, it becomes very complex to unravel um, who provided what input and where did the error and omission occur? Um, was it the result of one party's uh, negligence or was it because of multiple parties? Uh, so you can imagine that if you don't have these provisions in place stating clearly how that responsibility occurs, uh, it becomes much more difficult uh, to sort that out after the fact. My difficulties have come in, Mike, when a delegated design uh, is returned through the contractor to the design professional and how that delegated designer designed the solution to the the issue they were responsible for changed the design intent of the original design professional. Um, uh, it, it, it then involved or then required several different conversations or several different discussions about, well, it doesn't quite meet the design intent. It may satisfy the performance requirements uh, of the component you were to design, but it doesn't necessarily satisfy the design uh, aesthetic or intent that the original design professional uh, developed or had on this instruments of service. So my problems have arisen when the delegated design tried to modify the original design intent. So how 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 to deal with that issue when you ran into it? You um, sit down with everybody and you have discussions about, okay, what are my options? And so there's going to be a little give and take on both sides to uh, try and maintain the, as much of the original design intent as possible and still satisfy uh, the performance requirements or uh, uh, performance requirements that were included in the uh, specification. So it's a, uh, it, you know, it can be complex. It depends on how complex uh, the problem is um, as to how long it might take to resolve to, uh, to everybody's satisfaction. Absolutely. Um, well, guys, I want to thank you again for uh, for coming on here and talking about these new documents uh, and, and about just delegated design and design assist generally. Uh, any any far, uh, parting uh, thoughts before we wrap up here? Well, I, I guess I would say, uh, again, we created these documents to try and uh, fill a void that was uh, in the industry when we started talking to folks, talking to contractors and, and trade partners who, who, were, who were involved in design assist and delegated design services. And all of them said to us, if there was a document available, yes, we'd like to try to use it. So we hope that uh, everybody who's in earshot of this can say, okay, they're now available, um, use them. Uh, and we'll see if we were on the mark with uh, allowing it to be used for as many different purposes as we, uh, we had anticipated. Yeah, and I would encourage uh, taking a look at the resources like the white paper and think about how those terms apply on your project. Is it consistent with what you're hearing or are there differences? And, and even on the projects that are already in process and may not benefit from being able to use these documents now, um, even those resources may help to sort out some of the questions that, that arise. Absolutely, yeah. Go to uh, aiacontracts.org uh, and we've got plenty of resources on there, including that, uh, that white paper. All right, gentlemen, well, thank you very much. And uh, that will conclude this webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Josh.